All right, so I am gonna look at stuff that's specifically on the note sheet with you, but I wanna do a quick look at Desmos with you first, because I find that helps a little bit. So I'm gonna reset some stuff from the previous class. All right, so this curve doesn't really look like stuff that we've done before, right? Up until this point, we've mostly looked at that lines. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at something that doesn't look anything like a line, right? This is definitely a curve. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever heard somebody say, oh, it just grows exponentially. Have you ever heard somebody say that before? Okay, so when people say, oh, grows exponentially, what do they mean? Like, are they really using a math word? Not exactly, right? What do you think they mean when they say that? Theo? Growing it's growing largely, like quickly, right? Like if something grows exponentially, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, faster and faster and faster. So it's different than linear growth. Like linear growth is like, if I go to the movies with two friends, it costs 20 bucks. And if I go with three friends, it costs 30 bucks. Like it always goes up by 10 every time. Exponential growth would be like, well, it went from having two things to having four things. But then it didn't go to six, it went to eight. And then it went to 16. And then it went to 32. So like the gap is getting bigger and bigger every time. That's exponential growth. So when people use the phrase it grows exponentially, they're like on the right track with what that means. But they're not usually very specifically talking about exponential growth. They're usually just talking about it growing fast. So we're going to look at what does it actually mean in this class. All right, oh, I'm gonna change my scale because that looks confusing. All right, so I want you to notice something. See this y-intercept right here? Because y-intercepts have been pretty important in stuff that we've studied in the past, right? What's this y-intercept? Look at the graph, what's the y-intercept? Zero, one, right? It goes through the point zero, one. All right, what if I do that? Now what's the y-intercept? Zero, two. Now what if I do this, zero, four. So this first number, the A value, it has a lot of names. Sometimes it's called the y-intercept because that's what it is, right? That's the terminology we're used to. But in the context of exponential functions, it gets other names as well. It's often called the initial value. So initial, right, like the first one. So the initial value or the starting value or the amount it's based on, that's what the A value is, the initial amount, or we can also think of it as the y-intercept, okay? And that A value can be positive or the A value can be negative. I can have a y-intercept down here, right? Now my y-intercept is negative four. Everybody okay with that? Yeah? All right. So that one's the one that I feel like is pretty easy to understand. Whatever the first number is in an exponential equation, it tells you where to cross the y-axis. All right, I'm gonna put it back to positive because most of us prefer to think about positive numbers than negative numbers. All right, now this b value. There's exponential growth and then there's exponential decay. So there's two different things. Kind of like with a line, it can have a positive slope or a negative slope. All right, it's kind of similar to that. Except here it's not gonna be positive and negative. It's growth and decay. Now this one is growing. Would you agree that if you look at that, it looks like it's growing, right? As you read from left to right across the graph, it gets higher, faster and faster and faster. See how it just keeps getting steeper and steeper? Starts out not steep at all. And then as we move across, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And if I make B a bigger number, see how it gets even steeper? It gets so steep, it almost looks like it's going straight up and down. It's not quite going straight up and down, but it kind of looks like it is. Is everybody with me? Yeah? All right. Now, if I make B smaller, see how it's kind of flattening out? <gasps> what just happened? So is B negative? B is not negative, but B is a different kind of number than it was before. And we see that it like flipped over, right? Before it was going up. Now it's going down. This is decay now. This is the opposite of growth, okay? So we have growth where something's growing up, and then we have decay where we're getting less and less of something. Look really carefully at the B value, those of you who can see it. I know if you're sitting in the back of the room, it might be hard to read the B value, but it's the last number up there. So watch the B number carefully and tell me when it changes from growth 
to some to decay, uh, from decay to growth? What's the tipping point? Where does it change between decay and growth? When it stops being a decimal. Okay. Now, 1.5, isn't that a decimal or 4.5? Aren't those decimals? What do you mean by it stopped being a decimal then? And when it gets to 1, absolutely. So 1 is the tipping point. Okay? If it's bigger than 1, that's growth. That kind of makes sense. Let's think about this for a minute. What happens if I multiply something by 1? Like nothing, right? It stays the same. So 1 is not growth. 1 is not decay. Nothing happens, right? If I multiply by something bigger than 1, I'm going to get more of it. So that's going to be growth. If I multiply by a fraction, right? If I take half of something, do you have as much now? You don't, right? If I take a third of something, do you have as much? Oh, you got less, right? If I multiply by 0.8, that's only 80%, you don't have as much. So if I take a number that's between 0 and 1 and I multiply by it, that's going to be decay. I'm going to get less and less of it, all right? So that's going to be the tipping point on the graph. Okay, let's go look at our note sheet now. I'm going to skip around a little bit because it's a short day. I want to look at the top. So the, the top of the back of the first page. So flip your packet so you're looking at the top of the back of the first page. And we're going to kind of make a little chart here to help us organize our thoughts. So we're going to write growth and we're going to write decay. All right, so see where that little empty space is on your paper? Go to that part on your paper and we're going to write growth and decay. So growth is going to have a B value that's bigger than 1. Okay, growth is going to have a B value that's bigger than 1. B is called the rate of increase or the rate of decrease. There's a lot of vocab that goes into exponential functions. So B is what controls whether something is growing or decaying. If B is greater than 1, it's growing. If B is less than 1, but still bigger than 0, then it's decaying. Okay, so we grow if B is bigger than 1. We decay if B is between 0 and 1. So we're thinking decimals, fractions that are between 0 and 1. All right, those are our boundaries. Something to know about B is it will never be negative. It doesn't actually like make any sense if you look at the numbers for B to be negative. Because if you multiply by a negative number, well, when you multiply by it once, you go negative. But then when you multiply by it twice, you go positive. And then you multiply by it again, and you go negative again. So you'd be jumping up and down. You'd have these like dots up here, and then dots down there, and then dots up here, and then dots down there. Like that wouldn't be that nice curve. So B can't ever be negative, because it doesn't follow the pattern. So B will never be less than 0. If it's between 0 and 1, we've got decay. If it's above 1, we've got growth. So let's actually skip back to Desmos for a minute because something weird happened. Let's say I make, so does everybody agree that this is growth? Yes? This example is growth. B is 4.5. That's definitely bigger than 1. This is growth. I'm not going to change B. So B is going to stay bigger than 1. So that means this has to stay growth. But I'm going to do that. That doesn't really look like growth, does it? So we have to broaden our definition of growth because unfortunately, this is still growth. It's growing in its negative negativity. See how it's growing away from the x-axis? It's just growing down. Have you ever seen somebody, um, so normally if you want to plant tomatoes, you put them in the ground and the plant grows up, right? Have you ever seen the tomatoes that they hang upside down? It's weird. But there's this way of growing tomatoes where you actually hang the tomato plant upside down and the plant grows down. That's weird. Plants don't usually grow down, but a tomato plant will grow down. It's a way of growing tomatoes. So the tomatoes are growing in the negative direction. That's what this kind of growth is about. So because B is still bigger than 1, that's considered growth. So let's go back to our little chart. Growth means to grow away from 
the x-axis. So I can grow down and go away from the x-axis, or I can grow up and go away from the x-axis. The key is that I have to get further and further and further from the x-axis as I move to the right. Whereas decay goes towards the x-axis. So as you move to the right, it can go towards the x-axis from the top, or it can go towards the x-axis for the bottom, those are both called decay. And I will tell you that I always have to stop and think about the upside down ones. They look weird to me. And I'll, t I'll show you my trick when we start looking at some more graphs for how I keep it straight. But the upside down growth and upside down decay, that's a little tricky, all right? Okay, so we're gonna do a couple word problems today. We're gonna also do a couple of testing to see if something's growth or decay. We'll see what this looks like. Um, I'm gonna skip over that for right now, and we're gonna look at the sour beetle problem. This might be my least favorite problem of all the problems I do in all my math classes, because personally, not an entomologist, I don't like bugs. Some people do, that's awesome for them. I'm not that into bugs, but here we go. Suppose 30 flower beetles are left undisturbed in a warehouse bin. All right. So these bugs don't have any predators, and they've got lots of food. Everybody good? What's going to happen to these bugs? They're exponential growth, right? There's going to be a lot of bugs. All right, the beetle population doubles each week. The function f of x equals 30 times 2 to the x gives the population after x weeks. So this is this type of formula. See how it fits the pattern? y equals a b to the x. Remember a is our y intercept or our initial amount. My pen is too thick to zoom in this far. And then our b is growth. How do I know that b is growth and not decay? How does this B value show growth? Well, what is the B value? Two. Okay. Is two bigger than one or smaller than one? Bigger than one, right? Remember, if it's bigger than one, it's showing growth. So that's how I know this is growth. Also, I just know that if you leave bugs alone and give them lots of food, you'll get more and more bugs, right? So the context of the problem also helps you with that. Okay. So this is growth. And it's doubling every single week, which is just horrifying. All right. Now, we also can call this the rate of increase. So that's another term for B. There's lots of little vocab words that are going to come up today. So B is the growth factor. It's showing the rate of increase. All right. So we're going to ask some questions about this little formula now that we've identified the parts. Okay? And the questions are written right on your paper. The first thing says, what represents the initial value? How many beetles were there when we started? 30. What represents the rate of increase? How is this population growing? What number? Theo? Two, right? It's doubling every week. So the 30 is the initial value. And the 2 is the rate of increase. It's how much it's getting more and more by. All right, now here's a fancy question with a trick built in. I'm giving you a trick on the very first question. What am I thinking? You're going to be okay, though. You can totally handle this one. All right, what is the population after 56 days? Why is that a trick? Yeah, because the model said it doubles every week. Now they just gave us days. I can't plug 56 in, right? Because the model isn't about days. So how do I figure out how many weeks it is? 56 divided by 7. Okay. So I'm going to do 56 days divided by 7 days per week. And that's going to give me 8 weeks. So that's like the first work that I have to do. I have to figure out how long this really is. And then I can use my model. So I'm going to do F of 8. We haven't done much with function notation recently. You're going to see it sneak back in here. 
So f of 8, the function evaluated at 8 weeks, equals 30 times 2 to the 8th. Because remember, the x is the number of weeks. Okay, we've got to remember our order of operations. I see multiplying by 30, and I see raising 2 to the power of 8. Which of those things has to happen first? 2 to the power of the 8 has to happen first. Okay, so we're going to go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. Whew. So this is really 2. I'm sorry, 30 times 256. This is a lot of bugs. How many bugs is it? Too many, I agree. How many, though? What's the actual number? If you don't have a calculator, grab one from the thing. How many bugs is it? Come on, we only have four minutes. Let's go. Short class today. How many minutes? How many bugs? Or I'll have to make the calculation part of your homework if you guys can't do this. That's fine. We can do that. I'm going to move on. Okay. So part of your homework is to find this number. Do this at home. All right. Let's set up the other problem. It is. You just saved everybody, Paris. 7,680 beetles. Ooh, that's a lot of beetles after eight weeks. I don't want to go back and check out that warehouse at that time. That seems pretty horrible. All right, flip to the next page. There's another word problem there. This is a much more pleasant problem. An investment of $7,500 doubles every 12 years. The function f of x equals 7,500 times 2 to the x models the growth of the investment where x is the number of 12-year periods. So x isn't the number of years, it's the number of times 12 years has gone by. Does that difference make sense to everybody? Yeah? Okay. So it says you make this investment when you're 30. You're 30, you get a signing bonus at a new job, you're like, you know what, I'm going to plan for the future, I'm going to take my signing bonus, I'm going to put it in this investment account. Everybody's good? All right. How much money will you have when you're 66? What's the first thing we have to figure out? John? How old are you? Well, I'm 66. Oh, oh wait, no, no, no. I'm, I'm sure how many 12-year periods? OK. I need to know how many 12-year periods have gone by, which means I probably need to know how many years have gone by, right? So the first bit of math we're going to do is, Theo? I'm going to do division second. What do I have to do first? I bet you already did it in your head, which is why you're already on to the division step. I could do it with addition, right? I'm 30. I'm going to, I want to know how much money I have when I'm 66. What do I do with the 66 and the 30? Subtract. Subtract. So I'm going to say 66 minus 30. Okay, I'm saving for 36 years. I don't touch the money for 36 years. I am very disciplined. Okay? Now I've got to do the division, right? Because I need to know how many 12-year periods. So 36 divided by 12 is? 3. All right. So I'm doing f of 3. So f of 3 says take 7,500 and raise 2 to the third power. Well, that's easier than 2 to the 8th, right? 2, 4, 8. So this is 7,500 times 8. How much money will we have when we're 66? Quick, 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 because there's two errors on your daily practice sheet that I need to tell you about. 60,000. 60, so we'll have $60,000 if we're just really disciplined. All right, everybody's going to come see me super fast and grab this daily practice sheet because I have to make two corrections to it. There's typos on it. So get up, come see me, grab a daily practice sheet. Then take it back to your seat, but keep your pen out. Ooh, this one. Grab it, and then I'm going to write the two corrections right up here. You need to write them down, or you're going to have a lot of trouble with your homework. Quick, quick, quick. So flip to the back of the page. There's two word problems at the top of the page. Those two problems are your homework tonight. There is an equation in each one of them, and the issue is that they didn't format the equation correctly. The equations should look like this. 
So I would write this down so you don't have to look it up on OneNote later tonight. That's what your equation should look like. Those are the only two problems that you have to do for homework tonight. All right, so just write your equations down correctly, and you can do those two problems for homework tonight.